This week on The Futurists, Michael Margolis. I believe that narrative is our number one superpower of humanity. Mm -hmm. And as we outsource more and more to machines, what is the role, value, and contribution of us as humans? What is it that we can do that others can't? Hey there. Welcome back to The Futurists. I'm Rob Tursik. And joining me this week is the inevitable and inexorable Brian Solis. Brian, hi, 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 and welcome back to the show. It's good to see you, Robert. It's good to see you, Michael. I am so excited for this one. Me too. Uh, yeah, this will be a good show. It's good to be back with you. Uh, I've missed a couple shows that you've been on. Uh, you know how it works here. We uh, we swap off as we're traveling around different hosts in the, in the hosting chair. This week, our guest is a close friend, uh, someone I've admired and respected for ages, who's an expert in the subject of storytelling, but in a very interesting and constructive way. Welcome to Michael Margolis. Michael, hi. Good to, good to have you on the hey, future. Robert. Hi, Brian. So good to see you guys, man. So Michael is the CEO of a company called Storied, and um, that is a, a transformative narrative company or a narrative transformation company. There's all kinds of transformation consultants and digital transformation experts, but Michael, your expertise is narrative. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, look, in, in the context of the future, so much of what we're all doing is selling the future. So it's one of the ways you can look at the work that we do, which is, you know, we work with uh, heads of product and heads of design in the world of tech, and they constantly have to sell the future. Uh, what's unique about what where we tend to focus is we focus on the internal narrative, right, in order to create clarity, alignment, velocity, and whatever people are building. And, and, and the challenge when you are telling a story about the future, anytime you present the new story, anybody that lives in the old story is likely to feel wrong, bad, judged, stupid, hmm. or defensive. And ah, so the so art and little... science of our work is, is unpacking that. Yeah, so there's a little bit of uh, social engineering that has to occur around that. Huge. It's basically, how do you tell a love story about the future? Um, and so we do this for everybody from uh, Google, Meta, Uber, Shopify, and the like, have worked across 40 different industries. I started my career as a social entrepreneur, working mm -hmm. on the digital divide, uh, poverty and race, and basically who has access to technology. So I've always been like an armchair technologist, but I'm actually trained as a cultural anthropologist, which is how Brian and I, I think also are, you know, have, have had a bromance for, for a long time as well. Kind of an overlooked part of software development, you know, in, in the technology world, there's a lot of folks um, who build products who assume that the product speaks for itself. And that's just not the case. Uh, someone actually has to construct the narrative around that, around that product. Otherwise people don't know what to do with it. And we see that happen all the time where products are launched and it's like, here it is. And nothing happens and it sinks without a trace. You know, it's just a ripple in the ocean. Um, how do you help companies do, deal with that? Like, what is your strategy for doing that? Well, like at the practical level, it actually is things like H1, H2 reviews, right? So like every six months, heads of business units have to go in front of the executive team or in front of the board and present their vision and their strategy for the future. What, what we did the last six months, what we're doing going forward. So we'll build the narrative that's the upfront Mm -hmm. That then goes into here's what we're doing on the roadmap and the features. Here's the data and so on. So it's it's contextualizing, helping people see the bigger picture, mm -hmm. right? Of what's at stake um, and being able to humanize a product. So that's a big thing. Um, a lot of it is also helping with change management. So a lot of internal change initiatives and the various different things that people are trying to drive and addressing cross functional collaboration or XFN. So it's actually like a series of stories. Design, yeah. So there's a story you tell your boss and the story that you tell the board, and then there's the story that you tell the team. And then later when the product is ready to launch, there's the story that you tell the world. Is that kind of the way it works? Yeah. And think about it, to use a software metaphor, one of the biggest challenges is version control. Things are oh. moving so fast, people <laughs> don't story. know what story they're in anymore. Yeah, that's true. That's a really right? good point. Yeah. One of the things that I, I always found interesting about story yeah. And whether it's the future, or the present is the audience mm. and that there are usually a couple of audiences. One is the, the person on the other side of the, of the table yeah. or the screen. And, uh, and then there's also their audience mm. and connecting to that person and through that person 
in order to, you, you know this but, you know, better than anyone, you know, in order to evoke that sort of human-centered empathy yeah. to not just have that entrepreneur or that founder or that creator sort of fixed mindset, but also to allow it to be permeated by the feelings and opportunity of the people that they're trying to connect with as well. Mm-hmm. How, how you know, how, I'd love to hear how you sort of navigate that because especially in Silicon Valley or anyone yeah. with any kind of confirmation bias, yeah, that is one of the challenges to to navigate. It's a great question, and I mean, what I hear in that question is a lot of kind of the end user um, sort of, you know, from a user centric or consumer centric, you know, human centric perspective of um, in that side of it. We work with a lot of heads of design who do that foundational research um, and they have the insights from the user. I typically spend less time, though, focusing on the market facing or consumer facing narrative. It's really important I think there's an overlooked part of the equation, which is the internal story that drives hyper growth and transformation. And it, it's kind of like the old, uh, what was it, Richard Branson, who was like, hey, if you take care of your employees, they'll take care of your customers, they'll take care of your shareholders. So similarly, I think the nexus point, the acupuncture point of transformation is creating clarity and alignment inside every major organization on the planet. And that's where there's there's so much thrash and disconnect right now. Um, so that's that's the place that we play. And and what we hear all the time is there's a there's a word for it at Google. They call it how to influence without authority, right? So people are constantly in a position. No matter who you are, you constantly feel like you don't have the power, permission, or authority to shape the narrative or craft the narrative. Oh no, that's a that's above my pay grade. So a lot of what we do is we help people actually take charge of the narrative, no matter their positional authority. Um, And that becomes like literally rhetoric, like applying structured thinking and how you make a business case. How do you get buy in for your ideas? How do you humanize the data? How do you how do you context switch depending on the internal stakeholder audience? So our work is almost more like leadership development, organizational change Mm -hmm. focused as opposed to the way we typically think of storytelling more in a brand centric and advertising consumer centric manner. That's a very constructive approach. And in, in a way you can see that as like professional development for people. Yeah. Um, and in, in, in the absence of like a structured way of thinking about narrative and how to tell a narrative that is constructive and yeah. positive, um, you can kind of see what people do that, that maybe goes wrong and it goes sideways uh, because the, you know, Today, there are an awful lot of people who feel empowered to complain at work, you know, so they'll come forward with a negative statement or a statement of resistance, or they'll point out that, you know, something that's being done is unjust or unequal or whatever cause that they want to espouse for that particular moment. Um, The problem is that kind of feedback does two things I think are not great. First, it creates dissent uh, and it kind of like, you know, causes the whole organization to respond in a defensive way. That's not constructive. But the second thing is, um, I don't think people realize when they when they voice concerns in that unconstructive fashion, they're actually earmarking themselves for future dismissal because they're seen as someone who can't think constructively how to, how to move this forward or how to address those things. So what you're what you're saying is here are a set of tools yeah. th- that are communication tools internally. Um, you're using the term story or the term narrative to describe them. But what you're really saying is here's a better way to communicate constructively, to build team uh, consensus and, c- and shared understanding and a clear vision of where we're going. Uh, so in a way, it's like how to clean the mud off the windshield. We're all in the fast lane, we're driving fast, but we can't see much. Uh, I get it, that's a really good story. I and mean, I've talked to you about this dozens of times. Yeah. I'm so surprised it's still taking me this long to get my head wrapped around it. <laughs> it's it's coming at things sideways, but to your point, um, here's, here's an interesting lens to look at this from. Um, most organizations today are suffering from an autoimmune disorder. Hmm. Let me explain that. So I struggled with 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 autoimmune challenges earlier in my life. So when you have an autoimmune challenge, um, what happens is the boundary between self and not self, right? Like we have like an immune system that literally guards us, friend versus foe, that which is external threat. And when you have an autoimmune challenge, the boundary gets blurred. You don't quite know what is me, what is not me. And what happens is the immune system starts attacking itself or starts attacking your own body. Yeah, this is what's going on in most organizations today, as well as what we're seeing in our society right now. 
we're dealing with an autoimmune disorder. And from a, hmm. and you can look at it, it's fascinating. You can look at it from the perspective of like your brain on story and from an anthropological perspective. So let, let's talk about that for a moment because this will, this was a big aha for me, which is when people experience a story, there are three biochemical hormones that are activated cortisol, dopamine, and oxytocin. Right? And these may be familiar to some of us because we've been talking about these and how these play out in social media and how these play out in a lot of different contexts. Cortisol is fight, flight, freeze. It's literally the stress hormone. Yeah. And it's the binary. We're constantly evalu threat evaluation, friend versus foe. Is this me? Is this not me? Do I belong? Do I not belong? Right? That's that's cortisol. Then dopamine is instant reward. Yeah. This is what we're like going after, instant gratification, reward center. And then lastly is oxytocin. That's the belonging molecule. It's literally that which binds us together. Um, and that's what happens when, you know, a newborn child, we fall in love, an amazing meal, oxytocin. So the thing is, most of the, most of the stories that we consume in our social media feeds, in our email inbox, like all of our inputs have us in a perpetual state of cortisol, 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 and we're chasing the dragon of dopamine, mm. right? So the cortisol dopamine drip, it's like the one-armed bandit from Las Vegas. But ultimately, what we're all desperately wanting is more oxytocin, where we discover the invisible lines of connection, how we are more similar than different. Okay. So this plays out. This is literally when we build the architecture of a narrative, we're playing with those dials. We're reducing cortisol, we're increasing dopamine, and we're really figuring out how to unlock oxytocin because we're in an environment right now that is so polarizing. And it goes back to your point earlier, Robert, around, around this, this notion of people being on the defensive. Our society is obsessed with what's broken, what's wrong with what needs to be fixed. Instead of celebrating what's right, what's possible, right? The inherent potential in something. And I think that's the way we have to be looking at the future. Mm -hmm. Because when we start with what's wrong, we inherently activate that cortisol, fight, flight, freeze, and the conversation's over before it's begun. So these yeah, are these, right. this is the slipstream that I think a lot of us often overlook. And you're thinking like a game designer. Those are the same levers that game designers <laughs> use to get to propel you through to the next level. Yes. Uh so um Okay, so somebody listening to this show, I'm sure right now yeah. they're thinking, wait a minute, this is a show about the future. They talk yes. to futurists. And now we're talking to a guy who focuses on story, which is about the past. And mm. even the name of his company is the past tense. It's storied. How does that fit? Explain how your work <laughs> yeah. pertains to the future. Well, so actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I have to lovingly challenge you on this. So storied, <laughs> for instance, okay, the reason we're called storied is because the power of story is revealed not as a noun, but as a verb. Storied, mm -hmm. right? It's in the conjugation. It's in the verbalization, right? Verbs are action. Verbs actually move us forward. Mm -hmm. Most people think of story as a static artifact. People think of a story as beginning, middle, and end, right? And this is one of the most important distinctions, by the way, for everybody listening. Most people do not understand the difference between story versus narrative. And 99% of most storytelling trainings and books overlook this. A story is a specific event. Beginning, middle, and end. It's an anecdote. It's a thing. It happened. A narrative is a more abstract concept. It doesn't necessarily have a clear beginning or an end. You can think of, uh, you know, a narrative is the Christmas tree. Stories are the ornaments that go on the Christmas tree. In that distinction, most of the time we're swimming, we are lost in a sea of stories, an infinite sea of stories, literally billions upon billions and trillions of stories right now. Most of us have lost the plot. We don't understand what is the narrative or how to construct a narrative, much less create one that is a unifying narrative. That's the ultimate lever of power of change and transformation. Okay, let's zoom out from the tech Please. industry for a second and, and let's think about um, society in general. Yeah. Are there any public figures that you feel are extraordinarily good at this process of building unifying narratives? Anybody that inspires you or where you, where you, you know, derive some inspiration? Um, there are definitely folks out there. I'm, I'm a little bit biased. I tend not to look externally for sources of inspiration in all areas of my life. But um, to this point, I think someone who came close to it for a good period of time was Obama as a campaigner. Mm -hmm. Not Obama mm -hmm. as, you know, as a governor. 
right? Um, but but on the campaign, he did it effectively. Um, and then when he actually got into office, he thought, you know what, we're going to let the facts speak for themselves. We're going to let the work speak for itself, right? And we actually saw the cost and the, and the impact of that because he lost control of the narrative. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think that's a really important one. Yeah, I, I think we're, we're frankly, th- there's a lot of what I call narrative collapse right now. Yeah, I was right? going to say that. I, I'm trying, I'm racking my brain trying to think of a great storyteller. You can't find one in politics because all they do now is press the fear button. And, um, and it's true on both, you know, both parties. Uh, it's just, you know, get people to react to stuff that's outrageous or shocking or, you know, something else. Um, that's not what you're talking about. And actually, that doesn't really propel us forward. That keeps us sort of locked into our positions. I suppose that's good politics. You know, one one to pay attention to and um, is Vivek. So um, he's a former Silicon Valley guy, right? Yeah. Who's um, running for for president on the Republican side? Um, yeah, I, I don't connect him to his policy. He's a you know hyper libertarian. Yeah. Not, not not quite my my. Um, yeah, my but we can still we can still check out his narrative skill, right? Pay attention to his narrative skills. He okay. actually has incredible understanding of rhetoric and communications. And frankly, okay. by the way, while we're on the subject, let's you want to talk about Trump from a narrative perspective. Brilliant yeah, he's, at narrative. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, the challenge, yeah. though, and here here's what I want to say to all of us who worry about this stuff about narrative, because look, narrative can get weaponized, and it and it has as long as human beings have been on this planet. Yeah. The thing, though, that is a self regulating mechanism about narrative is that if if you are not telling a love story about the future, if you ultimately do not have a life-affirming narrative, it will not scale and perpetuate over time. It Mm. ultimately collapses. You just have to be patient and you have to just trust the process. Right? So this is why, like, I look at... Yeah, please. Let me ask you something there, because the Cassandra complex is, is also, let's say Trump is very good at weaponizing the Cassandra complex. Yeah, uh, explain and, the Cassandra uh, complex for all of us and everyone listening. Well, for without going all the way back into ancient history, it, yeah. it's just the concept that for people who are saying there's trouble up ahead or there's something bad that's going to happen if we stay on this path, yeah. we need to do something about it now, they tend to get hit with the most negative of responses because nobody, like you're saying, wants to hear what's wrong. They want to hear what's good. But the, the thing that I've always struggled with Trump is that, or anybody like that, is that not only not only are you lying about the future, but when you're weaponizing the future in that regard, yeah. It's it's supposed to have a lifespan, but it's only it's only spreading like a forest fire. Uh, And so I was curious about that, like stories that inspire the future are involving. They're inclusive. They're inspiring. They're they're optimistic. What what, where's the balance here? Yeah, well, there there's a a, so at a foundational level, before we get to a, a, a narrative that is a life affirming and generative narrative, there's a more basic fundamental human need from a narrative perspective. And that is simply, I need a story that explains how the world works. Mm-hmm. That's it. How does the world work? And, and anthropologically, that's how stories like that was their function, right? We had elders who told us the stories. Here's how the world works. This is your place in the world. Don't eat the purple berries. This is how we hunt the buffalo. (laughs) And you knew your place, right? And so that is where some of these, you know, any big narrative from a position of authority can fill that need. So if someone is feeling disconnected and and is feeling, um, you know, displaced or is, is looking for, wait, the world doesn't make sense like it used to, right? We're open. We're looking for a narrative to basically fill that void. And I think that's the appeal that you'll find from from many different political movements, um, whether they're life affirming or coercive. Yeah. Uh, so, OK, with politics, you know, there's the battle right now is between people who want to preserve the status quo and people who want to demolish the status quo. So that's mm-hmm. neither of those is a very constructive vision of the future. And we tend to look to the tech industry to give us that kind of uh, beacon of light for the future. And around the, in the tech industry, they're, they've been extraordinarily successful in constructing a narrative of invincibility or, or inevitability, right? So the idea is that you know, the future in the, in the tech world is, 
is coming fast. It's always bright. It's going to be incredible, transformative. It's going to confer superpowers on us and so on. You know, to some extent, that's true. And to some extent, it's just the purest bullshit. And it's magically powerful. Yeah. Uh, we all seem to believe it. Although lately, that story's got a little tarnish on it. Uh, that story hasn't aged uh, particularly well this year. Uh, now, you don't help companies with their outbound messaging and you don't help them with, um, with the we're marketing. We're doctors, the yeah. Are. Yeah, we're not putting lipstick on a pig. Can you comment on that, though? Can you talk a little bit about yeah. the fall from grace of the big tech companies? Maybe it's that classic yeah. hero story, you know, where we build something up and then it's fun to watch it crash and burn. Well, yeah, I think that's more commentary on, frankly, journalism and modern mass media, yeah. right? Like... Uh, there's a few ways to look at this. Let, let, let me let me put it to you uh, this way. So first of all, um, 99% of most n- stories that we tell are morality tale, right? We're focused on who's right, who's wrong, what's good, what's bad, okay? And in this, again, this worked great when we were like small tribes, where we were, you know, monotheistic religions, when we were a, a closed system. But you see, we're in an environment now where worldviews and value systems are colliding. And so one of the biggest evolutionary shifts that I'm seeing right now is we are looking for a new narrative framework beyond morality tale. But it takes rewiring because we're so we're so obsessed with labeling right, wrong, good, bad. OK, so this is what the media does. This is frankly what we all do. It's what we do yeah. on social media and so on. So that's one. And we can unpack that a little bit more if you want. Um, the the other piece of this, though, to your, your question, like what's the commentary about the tech industry and sort of the hype cycle, what is often missing or overlooked is discourse, mm. right? Mm. Which is as an executive, being able to talk about the role, function, and value of your technology or product in people's lives, including the second order or third level order effects. Now, someone who's really good at this, by the way, is someone like Tim Cook at Apple, Right. He has a very sartorial perspective of zooming out. Um, Satya actually does this pretty well over at Microsoft as well. Um, you know, it's it's really being able to talk about like philosophically, what are we grappling with in thinking mm-hmm. about the the role of this technology and how do we as a society interact with it and adapt to it? That's what the tech industry needs to be doing more of. Um, mm-hmm. And some executives are really naturally good at it. And sometimes people just are so obsessed with the function of the tool. They think that it's just function, 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 instead of aspiration and emotion in the cultural, social context. Yeah, that's how people come away with the impression that the tech industry is amoral uh, or indifferent to the consequences. Uh, and sometimes there are big social consequences of new technologies. Yeah. Brian, you go. There's, oh gosh, I want to pick that one up and maybe we can do that yeah. after the break. You know, Michael, to your point, there's another there's another type of leader that I would love to see more of in Silicon Valley. Uh, Johnny Ive, Brian Chesky, mm. storytelling from a design perspective. Yeah. Uh, and that, it, it takes, it, it's, it's almost like a whimsical style. It takes, it takes you to a place because they know you so well. They don't just know you. They know the you aspirationally, which is all. And Steve Jobs had that same gift. Uh, they want to take you to a better place. Yep. And that, man, I've just been, I'm, I'm writing my next book. and I've just been breaking down uh, these, their, their capacity. Uh, and, and I don't know, for those listening, Brian Chesky is the co-founder of, of Airbnb, but he's also a student of Johnny Ive and a client of, Johnny Ives' new uh, company, Love From. And there's a wonderful story that Johnny tells of his advice to Brian. It was when Airbnb was facing one of its many challenges and they were they were going to have to make a lot of cuts. And Johnny said, you know, innovation is, is, is a constant challenge, basically. And he said, you're never going to cut your way to innovation. And even how these storytellers talk to themselves, it's incredibly aspirational. What it, What is it about the designer that has never really been able to break beyond this little niche of storytelling in Silicon Valley? I'm just curious on your thoughts. I spent a lot of time with designers um, in design leadership. And 
I've got a few perspectives on it. I think one is inherently designers tend to be an introverted profession and one that is like a lot of other crafts, they tend to be obsessed with the craft and they focus so much on describing the craft and what we're doing with the craft instead of being able to translate the philosophy and the discourse. And there's so much philosophy and discourse in human-centered design and design thinking and design systems and design ops, and all of these things, but they don't spend enough time translating that into the language of business. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of the coaching that we do with right now we're working with with a head of design and one one of the biggest tech companies um, on the planet around the evolution of their design system and how to communicate that um, the relationship between the design org and engineering. Right. And building that bridge. So I think that's a big part of it. Um, But I think you're also speaking to something else, Brian, inherently, which is I think designers have an appreciation for experimentation, for prototyping, for beta, for, for, for really the inherent messy process of creation. And I think that's the other critical part. We have to learn how to celebrate that and memorialize that and, and really turn that into something that uh, is more than just lip service, right? Because the, the challenge is the moment you get out of kind of early stage startup, or if you have a or you have a really protected skunk works, there's this immediate pressure to, you know, I've worked with a lot of R&D labs and the pressure they're under to like, we better make sure we com- get something commercialized on the product roadmap, right? Like that path or like, you know, corporate disruption. We want disruption, but, you know, we want it to be well-behaved, measurable disruption, right? It's like, just like the fundamental pressure of a corporation, which is in the risk management business, which is inherently different paradigm than what it means to be on the front end of innovation, where you're, you're, you really are in that place of emergence. I don't know. What do you think? I, 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 I this is part my, this is my work, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm internal and external. Yeah. And I, I spent a lot of time building bridges. And one of the things that I've had to understand is even though I'm not designing products, I am designing a version of the future or yeah. versions of a potential future that has to be inviting, inclusive, uh, maybe less scary, but also the thing that, that I've, I've, I've struggled with is the, uh, what's in it for me and that's i've always i've always admired steve jobs ability where he he tells you that you're gonna be better in his version of the future uh and that part uh is is the magic it's the magic uh because as you said earlier you know change and and robert said this too the status quo you know, no one really inherently wants to believe that what they do and what they believe is not necessarily the right thing for tomorrow. But together, if we follow this vision, this aspirational vision, and we all net these things, yeah. we're in a better place. And this is what the road looks like to get there. But I'll be there along with you the, each step of the way. That, that, that's the art and science I've, I've, I've yeah. grappled with my entire career. I think the key word that many of us as innovators overlook, though, is safety, right? We're comfortable in the unknown, and most people in an organizational matrix are desperately trying to manage the known. And I mean, they're trying to manage the unknown, but to them, the unknown is pure, is just risk. And I think there, there, it's that gap that we have to learn have, having compassion for how to make it safe for those who aren't inherently wired, like maybe the three of us might be, who love being on the leading edge of pioneering and, you know, sort of like inventing the future. Well, that's a little bit about uh, transformational leadership and good stuff. Let's take a break here. But before we go to the break, Michael, we love to administer this procedure, uh, um, which is called, <laughs> speaking of safety, <laughs> the lightning round. All right, let me buckle up. So, Michael Margolis, you are in the hot seat. Uh, We want short answers here. This is just a chance for our audience to get to know you a little bit more. Uh, We love to ask people, the first question is always, what was your first experience of science fiction? The earliest science fiction movie or book that you can remember? I'm not a big sci-fi guy, Buck Rogers. 
Buck Rogers. Buck okay, Rogers. great. That would be a first for the show. Um, <laughs> now, is there a particular person who is uh, future minded, maybe a technologist or a leader of some sort, maybe a storyteller, a particular person whose vision of the future inspires you? It's going to seem random. The first person who comes to mind is Terrence McKenna, who actually mm. was an ethnobotanist and cultural anthropologist, but he had something really important to say about the future, which was um, that time is accelerating. If you think of time as a function of the quantity of experiences that it contains, right? So if you think of what, what was the unit of one year, like 10,000 years ago, how much life happened in one year if you were a human being on the planet versus how much happens in the unit of time of one year today? That's cool. It's the same, right? Same reason why I'm like, hey, live in New York City. Like living one year in New York City is like dog years, right? It's like yeah. seven <laughs> years of ordinary life. Um, but this notion of time as a function or measurement of the experiences that it contains and understanding that as, as one of the lenses about the future um, has always deep, deeply inspired and influenced me. That's cool. Terrence McKenna, now we sound like a bunch of uh, college students in a dorm room with a bong. Um, moving on to the next question. Yeah. Is there a particular <laughs> um, particular forecast or prediction that has, in, has influenced you? Mm, the first... I think my first exposure to futurists or forecasters was um, this merry band of of uh, a futurist called Iconoclast. They were out of Minneapolis, and um, they they were really great. Um, they have a great book which um, was called "The, the Future Ain't What It Used to Be." Mm. Um, and they were really good at talking about the future through the lens of, of, of changes in culture from a values-based perspective. And that that's something that always really influenced me, like um, the way that, uh, you know, like, say, like, take Whole Foods today, right? Whole Foods is a company. They understood that people wanted to care more about where their food comes from and how it's made, right? Like that bet on this underlying cultural value seeking expression has led to the organic natural foods movement, which is a, you know, God knows, you know, tens of billions of dollar industry today. But 30 years ago was, you know, a bunch of um, hippie granolas, you know, in a college dorm room with a bong. There we go. Bringing it full circle. We're going to take a break. We are listening to Michael Margolis on The Futurists. Hang tight because we're going to come right back after this message. Provoke Media is proud to sponsor, produce, and support the Futurist podcast. Provoke.fm is a global podcast network and content creation company with the world's leading fintech podcast and radio show, Breaking Banks. And of course, it's spin-off podcasts, Breaking Banks Europe, Breaking Banks Asia Pacific, and the Fintech Five. But we also produce the official Finnovate podcast, Tech on Reg, Emerge Everywhere, the podcast of the Financial Health Network, and Next Gen Banker. For information about all our podcasts, go to provoke.fm or check out Breaking Banks, the world's number one fintech podcast and radio show. Welcome back to The Futurists. I'm Rob Tursik, and this week my co-host is Brian Solis, and we're talking to Michael Margolis, the CEO of Story. Uh, hey, Brian, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your new book, because I know you've been thinking about scenario planning, and that's a topic that comes up quite a lot. And that's kind of a narrative as well. It's a narrative about the future. Tell me a little bit about what you've discovered in terms of scenario planning as you're writing. The, the book is about how you spark a mind shift in someone in the best possible way, rather than being held back by everyone we find a way to inspire everyone forward and we learn, unlearn and grow together. And the idea of that is painting versions of the future that are compelling and motivating uh, and understanding the art of doing so. So I combine it with this practice that I learned as an analyst, which is the whim exercise or what it means exercise. So you take any trend uh, you, you, that's, that's important to your business or to your world the series of trends, and you try to understand at an individual level what each means to your world on a horizon level, immediate, longer term, you know, maybe 10 years out. And then you take those what it means uh, exercises, and then you try to apply the narrative. And then 
the arc, the story arc to those those narratives of possible versions of the future that would then be opportunities to unite people around. This is this is a, a scenario that could happen. These are some of the things that I found in terms of evidence and and research. And let's be collaborative about one way to solve for that. And you create a scenario planning exercise that people feel included in rather than you telling them what to do in this particular scenario. And so the the book is an approach to unlocking that inner futurist in everyone so that it makes it meaningful at an individual level so that people feel like parts of the ideas of what we do differently moving forward are theirs. And it's this sort of, I don't know, maybe a Jedi mind trick around getting people to embrace a bit of the unknown, even though this hasn't happened yet, the conversation itself is starting to make it a little bit more known. So yeah. that's that's how I'm thinking about it. Yeah, that's necessary. I mean, look, if you're trying to get a team to focus on building something that doesn't exist, you've got to get them to live vividly in the in a scenario in the future. And um, and what we've seen on this show, because the topic comes up quite a lot with futurists, so scenario planning is a you know quite popular technique. It's a useful technique. Uh, Thomas Frey, in the in the interview we did with him, he demonstrated it live. It was really great. He showed us how to interrogate possible futures. So you posit something, you know, in the future, we're going to play golf on Mars. Cool. And then you start asking questions. How do we get there? What does a club look like? What kind of uh, tool, what kind of equipment do we use? How far does the ball go? And you, you, you cause people to think kind of athletically about that scenario. And in the process, they're going to uncover some pros and cons and some unknown opportunities and some new obstacles and so forth. All things that can be solved for or addressed. Uh, that's that's one technique. Um, we also had Julian Bleeker on uh, on the show, and he talked about narrative fiction, um, which, Michael, I forgot to mention this to you earlier. Such a good show because he's a designer. Yeah, so, he's, a, uh, he's a special human. Yeah. So, you know, a moment ago before the break, we were talking about designers and, and how rare it is. He has this incredible technique for envisioning the future. He makes an Ikea catalog and and shows how you would market that product, like what the, what the product benefits are for and so forth, and shows like people using it and so forth. And it's a you know, product that doesn't exist for a world that hasn't come yet. So that's another way to vividly project people into the future. Um, Michael, talk a little bit about scenario planning and your narrative practice, because an internal focus, the ones we're talking about so far are more like product and market, yeah. um, but you're thinking more like team and process. And yeah. I'd be interested to One know strategy, if there's an analog yeah. there. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to be a little bit contrarian here in that. Um, uh, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Can't do it. Well, I don't, I, I don't, I'm, I'm trying to temper my bluster because I, I so, I so love Brian and, and, and all of your work. And I think, I think I'm excited to read this next book. I would, I think one of the ants, one of the things you need to answer in the book is the following, which is, is scenario planning dead? Because when I have conversations with executives, they seem, they're so overwhelmed about um, that the fundamentals are upside down. What worked, what worked to now is not what's going to work going forward. People are in such a place of not understanding which ways up, down, left, or right, that people don't feel they have a luxury to do scenario planning or the idea of having a three-year plan, a five-year plan, a 10-year plan. Like, I don't know what organizations have a 10-year plan anymore other than um, I'm doing a little bit of work with NASA's JPL. Like, you know what? They have a 10-year plan, but you know what? They're working on some pretty monumental interplanetary stuff. I can understand mm -hmm. why they might be looking at a 10-year horizon. Um, so. That said, I do think, look, we're the future matters. The future, I've always been about living in the future and working your way backwards. And so I think the thing that's really interesting, and you were talking about this earlier, Brian, as well, is what is it about the future that's inevitable? Right? Like, for instance, is the future going to be more open or closed? Right? Is the future going to be more transparent or more opaque? Like, what are fundamental forces, economic, political, cultural, technological? And for us to say, you know what, this is where the world is going. 
right? So let's skate to where the puck is going. And I think that's the way that I have seen in the, in the, in the executive boardroom being able to, to make a bet or have a thesis about the future or dealing with VCs and basically having a thesis about the future of okay, we hang think on. this whoa, is where the world's whoa. going. Yeah. You're talking about VCs and boardrooms and often those two mingle. Uh, sometimes yeah. there's crossover. And here we have the, uh, the, the challenge of the charismatic egomaniac uh, oh, yeah, who understands the future. Yeah. Fair who enough. understands the future and is going to tell you how the future works. I mean, every That's, one of us has encountered that person in the boardroom and they have like I've one that future. person. We've all been that person. Yeah. Okay. So there's like one future, right? For that person. And they mm-hmm. really can't tolerate the diversity of scenarios. The key to scenario planning is that you look at all the possible futures. You don't put a weighting on it. You don't put a judgment on it. It's like you're neutral. You're looking at all of them. You're going to interrogate all of them. The failure to do this is how companies go wrong, right? Because they convince themselves. We saw this recently with uh, social media companies that launched products, kind of a vainglorious notion about the future that they were the you know leadership team was obsessed by, and sent the whole team charging down the trail, spending billions of dollars. You know exactly who I'm talking about. Um, and you know there was obviously spectacular failure. Uh, and actually, you can say. There've been a number of different instances where that's happened in the last 10 years as the tech industry has sought to find a successor to the smartphone. Like you know, the phenomenal success of the smartphone hasn't yeah. been replicated in 10 years. We've tried everything from, you know, um, everything from metaverse to cryptocurrency. Uh, now we're trying with artificial intelligence, maybe that'll stick. Um, but the challenge there is that you've got a, a charismatic leader who has a very clear vision, he thinks, or she thinks of the future and sends the whole team charging down that track without sufficiently interrogating a range of possibilities and evaluating all the possible futures. The fact is there's many different futures, right? We don't really talk about the future. We talk about the futures because of course, there's a branching phenomenon that's happening here. Many things are possible. Some are probable. Yes. Um, okay. So on that note, Let's talk about some news because yeah. uh, the you know the theme lately has been social media is melting down. I've seen all these yeah. news articles lately about the end of social media. The social media era is over. Yeah. No one's on Facebook. Although I'm on Facebook, it seems like there's plenty of people on Facebook. Twitter's <laughs> melting down. Well, so it seems like there's plenty of activity on Twitter as well. Perhaps these stories are exaggerated from the doom mongering uh, press. That's possible. Um, but there's actually news. So tell me, Michael, about Meta's big announcement. Yeah, well, literally yesterday, uh, Meta just uh, released threads, um, which, you know, the media has quickly framed as the Twitter killer. Um, But it's basically, uh, (laughs) right, like text-based threaded conversation. It's actually a spinoff of Insta, which I think is a a really smart move by, by Meta. And they're also building it. Um, with underlying architecture of active pub so that it can be, what is it, federi- federalized or federized? So it will ultimately be able to be interop with Mastodon and some of the other um, mm-hmm. type of like, you know, global town square places. Um, here's, I think, the thing. Um, and by the way, within less than 24 hours, 10 million new accounts, all right, opened up on threads. So, you know, people love to talk about Meta is dead. Look, there's, there are plenty, I know most people's relationship with Facebook is it's complicated and I get it, right? <laughs> um, it, it, there, it's, there, there are many aspects to this. Um, I do have a privileged relationship with that company being, being an advisor to them since 2016. Um, but the reason why I've always really been fascinated and appreciated our partnership is it's the biggest storytelling platform in the history of the universe. Right. There's nothing else on the planet that re- that is a, a greater reflection of collective consciousness or that engages and reaches more people. You got three billion plus monthly active users. So um, what they're doing with threads, here's the significance of it that I think we should not overlook. People are like, oh, it doesn't work yet like it should. And All right. <laughs> Great. It just launched in 24 hours. Give it a break. Um, but keep this in mind. Um, why did Elon buy Twitter? Big picture. Why do we think Elon bought Twitter? I'm sure you guys have talked about this. I mean, there's an ego reason there, yeah. certainly. No, no, strategic. <laughs> From a strategic business perspective, why did he buy Twitter? What, what's the what's the uh, what's the greatest prize asset of Twitter? I don't know. Tell us, tell us what you got, because we could go off on a tangent there. Yeah. Cut, cut to the chase. Yeah, um, I'm holding so, back. 
the, one of, I think, the most fascinating perspectives on why Elon bought Twitter is that in the context of generative AI and large language models, is that it represents a real-time semantic, like, co uh, basically oh. collective consciousness. Right. He's talking about that now. That's not the reason he bought it. But yeah, of course, he's putting a fence around Twitter data right now because he sees it's a tremendous asset and he is trying well, to build his own generative AI system. That's certainly the case. Yeah, no doubt yeah, about it. I don't were, think that was People talked about that. No, when, when when the acquisition was happening, actually, this was one of the grand theories behind it. Um, but here's why I bring this up, because um, what, what Meta now will have with threads is a real-time large language model, neural network of collective consciousness. That's what yeah. threads will allow for and all the things that then emerge out of that. I mean, don't they already have that with um, with with all their other app platforms, with WhatsApp and Insta and Facebook? No, not in the same, you know, for, remember, remember what's, WhatsApp is, um, you know. Cute. Small group yeah, messaging. Well, but also like it's encrypted both ways. So yeah. they don't, right, the, 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 from a data perspective, that's closed. Insta is more visual driven, right? Facebook had a lot of that, um, but Facebook also has a lot of other things, right? Yeah. Twitter yeah, or threads diffuse. has always been that real time news, media, commentary, sort of the pulse of what's happening. Fair enough. Uh, okay. So, and it's also yeah. going to be more concise because Facebook yes. is a little bit spread across the planet. And and, and actually yeah. Insta has turned into television. You know, it's now it's like video and ads and stuff. Yeah. It's a bummer because yeah, yeah, yeah. I loved it as a visual platform. Uh, okay. So, so yes, that makes a great deal of sense. There's been a lot of speculation about the value of um, the value of the data for generative AI purposes. Yeah. in social platforms and it's not limited to twitter or facebook of course because reddit has done the same thing and actually other platforms uh have started to ring fence their data as well everyone understands that this this information can be useful this brings us to the topic of data and i, I want to talk to you a little bit about that because i know you got some thoughts about data um you know my sense is often um the people who focus on data uh it, it's we live in an interesting time because you can you can stop a conversation. It's literally like a thought terminating comment to say like I've looked at the data and the data suggests this and it's like okay, end of discussion, right? No more debate because we've looked at the data or someone says they have what data? Who knows? Uh, you know, often we use data as a proxy for making decisions or for intelligence, uh, and we're going to allow the past to inform the future. I question that. Um, I question. It. I think data might be overrated. Um, in one case, for instance. Uh, data is definitely an abstraction away from the original source. So what we call data is often, uh, you know, the work of a human being. And in particular, the, the data that's being mined or used um, without permission to train large language models, uh, that data represents not some resource, some natural resource. It's not the kind of data smog that Facebook collects when you traffic across the internet where they're tracking you. Uh, the data that's being used by companies like uh, OpenAI and the other companies that are training large language models is the work of human beings. And very often it's the work of human beings working at the peak of their intellectual output, at their peak of their abilities. Uh, it's the years and years of effort and training that have gone into these concise statements that are being used to train these systems. And they're used without consent, without credit, and without compensation. A lot of people resist that. A lot of folks are starting to speak up. And it's not just the Writers Guild that's on strike here in Los Angeles. Among their complaints is the use of generative AI for screenwriting. Uh, seems like a legitimate complaint. We've also seen news journalists uh, strike. And we're starting to see artists organize and speak up against this practice as well. This idea of, um, of data mining the work of human beings. And in a sense, it makes, I, I can understand it. I'm sympathetic to those groups because uh, effectively their data is being used to turn it into a weapon to replace them, to make them irrelevant, uh, to build something that might potentially replace them in the future or devalue their work. And this idea of uh, using the term data to describe the output of human beings in a way is dehumanizing uh, and it devalues the work of humans. Talk a little bit about that, if you will, because I want—I know you have many thoughts on this subject, and I want to hear you. I'll stop opining and hand the mic over to our guest to talk. Yeah. Well, so I mean, I work with some of the biggest data science organizations on the planet. So I, I, I and I, and I've, I like helping them actually communicate their role and value. And one of the places that we actually often start with is from the place that data is dead. Right. We have to remember that data is a story of the past. Yeah. Right. Whereas disruption is a story about the future. So we always have to start with the future first. 
And what you're pointing to, Robert, is there's an inherent bias heuristically with data that we think data is objective. We think data is the truth, but data often has many filters, right? And labels that like, you can take any position that you want and we can find data to support it. So I often say to people, right? If data is king, context and emotion are queen and the queen should always go first, Hmm. right? Well, the, the data part is a critical part of a business case and value propositions and persuasion. But what we tend to overlook is context, zoom out big picture, Let's capture the imagination, have people thinking about the future, what's possible now that wasn't before. And then let's zoom in, get up close and personal, get people to emotionally self-identify. Oh, yeah, I belong in that story. That's for me. So if you do those two things really well, the zoom out big picture and then the zoom in emotional like leaning in, now people will be begging you for the data that supports a promise right, of the future that you're selling because it's a positive promise of the future. Tell us about the future of generative AI. Talk a little bit about where you see this heading. Oh, man. Um, well, uh, boy, they they're, they're, don't even know where to start with this, but the first thing is words are the new code. Hmm. What do you and, mean by that? Well, so there are three most important scientific revolutions and discoveries of the last hundred years. One, was DNA, biologic code, right? Mm-hmm. Understanding the basic building blocks of, of human biology. Number two was binary code, computer programming, mm-hmm. right? Zeros and ones. Now we've entered this new phase where the semantic code, literally language, right? By the way, words create worlds. Language has always been, right? How we build and create and interact with reality. Mm-hmm. But now this is the underlying currency of the tech industry and ultimately what's going to be driving our economy and our society. This and is just a- to break that down for people yeah. who are listening. So what you're saying is the idea that anybody now can write software simply by talking to a chatbot, by by using regular language, human language, um, you can start to write code. Is that what you're saying? No. I mean, that that's one like one one derivative downstream consequence. Absolutely. What okay. I am saying is that, that um, and this is the premise, we, we recently had storied, forgive the shameless plug, but we've just launched the world's first learning community for narrative intelligence, right? I, be, I believe that narrative is our number one superpower of humanity. Mm-hmm. And as we outsource more and more to machines, what is the role, value, and contribution of us as humans? What is it that we can do that others can't, right? And it has to do with narrative. But understanding how to have narrative fluency and narrative agency, knowing how, because literally what is, what is generative AI, right? It's a language model. You have to understand language and how to interact with language. If you don't have a relationship with language, right, this is going to become the new digital divide. Does that make sense? It makes sense. And it's also, uh, speaking of language, yeah. it's, it's, th- this is really important because, for example, in my work, uh, we're we're experimenting with generative AI as a form of of uh, Robert, how you describe it for coding. Uh, and I, I brought this. I actually said these same words that words. Well, I said I said it this way. Words are the new code. And then I had to add via a prompt so that people understand that you're using the prompt as your opportunity to tell a version of the outcome you'd like to see and how you'd like to see it. But it's also the prompt as the UI, as a new form of of user interface and creating sort of this new world, this new opportunity of then we play out to spatial computing, we we play out to Neuralink, just even thinking in terms of the prompt. Uh, It it still all comes down to, Michael, what you're saying, what I think what I hear you saying is that the words that we use in that moment of the prompt will create whatever it is that we're looking to create, whether it's words, whether it's software, whether it's a game, whether it's a script, whether it's uh, it's whatever it is on that other side that we're using our language to create. Reality has always been a large language model. Like, let me give you guys this example, right? That's a bumper sticker right there. (laughs) It is. It's it's ontology. So ontology is the science of being, and it's all, all about literally language. So 
let's let's play this this little part of the game. My my friend Udi, um, this comes from the world of landmark, by the way, um, to give credit. But let, let's take a look at this. All right. So, um, what what is this? If this if this is a number, what is this? So for the people who are listening to the show, Michael's holding up one index finger right now. All right. So, if this, so, is, answer, yeah. so if this is yeah. if this is a number, what is this? So one index finger would be representing the number one. Okay. If this is a direction, what is it? So an index finger pointing up is direction is up. Yeah. If this is a body part, what is it? It's um, oh boy, my mind goes straight to the gutter. Um it's uh <laughs> you said it earlier no i know it's it's uh it's a single finger yeah right so this same this same object right is the number one is the direction up and is the body part of a finger yeah okay? it's all in the labeling this goes to the heart of what you were bringing up robert around data right and that we have we, we don't we, we overlook the fact that everything is labeling it's language what language are we putting on things? And think of how often you fight with your spouse, with a coworker, or some other audience. And all we're fighting over is we put different labels on the same thing. So the labeling so is the contextual to the frame. The truth of that one label that we think is the absolute truth. Okay. So the so what you're saying to to uh, just to bring home the the analogy yeah. um, when you're saying that uh, you know you, the example of the finger you're giving us it could mean many different things in yes. different contexts. Yep. And the label that we apply is the con is the contextual framing exactly. for that particular fact. So here's data. It's a bunch of facts. And different frames are basically like different lenses that bring that data into focus and allow us to make use of it in some practical way. I'm getting it. I'm learning. I'm le learning this from is you. Why, this is why what you guys were, what, what you were saying, Robert and, and Brian as well, context is everything. Yeah. Context is how you frame the future. Right. It's it's all about zooming out. We've lost the plot. People need to see the bigger picture. It's context. Give right? us the and future. Then, Give us a vision of the future. Tell us what's going to yeah. happen in 10 years, yeah. 20 years, 25 yeah. years. What's going to happen? Yeah. Are we going to continue fighting? Are people yeah. going to get along in the future? And, the, and then and then to your point, Brian, then show us that you give a shit, that you care, like um, like empathy, emotion. Bring it back home to me in some visceral, emotional way. You do those two things, context and emotion. Great. Now I want the evidence, the data that validates the premise that that we're looking at. Um, this is actually Aristotle's three proofs of rhetoric: ethos, okay. pathos, and logos. Okay, but we we're, our job here is to talk about the future, not Aristotle. So show me where this is heading. Tell me seriously. I want to forecast. Yes. Give me ten years, twenty years out in the future. Uh, right now, we're in a time of we're riven with yes. conflicts, and people are riddled with doubt, fear, uncertainty. I have not seen a time of of less optimism in my entire life. And I don't really understand it because uh, by most metrics, things are getting better. Yeah, right. And, and, and just to build on that, you've, you've said it a few times and I love it. We've lost the plot. Yes. So maybe putting it in the context, how do we get back? How do we get, how do we get back to the plot for the future that you see? I'm going to, I'm going to give you guys a rhetorical question. You mean you're going to dodge the question? But go. No, for no, it. I'm not. No, 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 no. This is actually this. This is the the. You asked for my prediction, and I'm going to unpack this um, happily. All right. Here's the question: um, Do leaders have to have faith in the future? F faith is faith, faith or conviction. Uh -huh. I no, think no, no. they have to have no, conviction. Um, very specific. Faith in the future. Do leaders have to have faith in the future? So, so this this is an interesting question because the, I do so much work in in helping leaders see an alternative future to what they have faith in already, uh, or or what they believe in, because uh, faith and belief, you know, they we can all peel that banana back to to confirmation bias. But another way to ask that question is: Do they have faith? in a version of the future that is your version of the future or Robert's version of the future, because I, I don't yeah. know that I've seen that leaders have faith in the future. They have faith in, uh, to Robert's point, they have faith in themselves. Um, yeah. And they might speak with conviction, but I, I think there's plenty of faithless leaders. And and, and for, unfortunately, when I'm on the spot right now, I'm thinking all the examples I can think of are faithless leaders. 
Michael, what's your point? Help us out. Bring the put a button on this episode, please. Um, so do leaders have to have faith in the future? If leaders don't have faith in the future, they do they belong in the seat of leadership? I, I think that faith in the future, and by the way, faith is a critical word here because faith is actually belief in the unknown. It's belief amidst uncertainty. The lack of predictability, do you still have fundamental, inherent, enduring faith in humanity, in our resolve, our creativity, our adaptiveness, and so on? I think, by the way, a lot of leaders have faith in the future. I just think most leaders do not know how to build the narrative that conveys faith in the future. Right, uh, and A that, lot of them that's, have faith in the, the next quarter. <laughs> yeah, but, but faith in the future is, it, it's, that's, at the end of the day, that's the fundamental human need. Right. We're looking for a story that makes sense of the world, our place in it and what comes next. So you have to fill that vacuum. And the reason I bring this up, Robert, kind of, you know, as kind of the closing point, my biggest prediction about the future, and especially with generative AI as a forking moment for humanity, it will make us not only better storytellers, better philosophers and better ethicists, it will also inherently force us to strengthen our spiritual practice, because um, in the face of existential crisis, it's amazing how we as human beings find God or whatever version of that you want to name or put a label on. Faith in the future. Wow. Okay. Taking us all the way (laughs) to spiritual conviction. I'm with you. Michael Margolis, uh, CEO, storied uh, expert in narrative transformation. Thank you for joining us on The Futurist this week. Me, Where can we find you on the web? Well, if people are listening, they'll be interested to learn more and learn about your courses in yeah. narrative uh, narrative comprehension. Yeah, yeah. so uh, storiedinc.com. Uh, we've just launched the world's first learning community for narrative intelligence. We have courses, coaching, um, we have a new flagship program called Narrative Influence, a five-week sprint method. You'll find that at storiedinc.com. And then you can also get my latest book, Story 10X, Turn the Impossible into the Inevitable. You'll find that on Amazon, Kindle, uh, Audible, and all that good jazz. And then so lastly, for heard. social, find me on LinkedIn is where I share the most. Okay, Michael. that's great. Michael, thank you for joining us on the show. Thank you, Brian Michael. Silly's always a great pleasure to see you again, my friend. So thanks for coming. And a big always shout nice. out to the folks at Provoke Media who make the show possible. Thank you very much, Kevin, Lisbeth, and the rest of the crew at Provoke. If you're listening to the show and you find this useful and constructive and interesting and inspiring, and I sure hope you do, please share it with a friend. Uh, the best thing you can do to help us grow the show is to give us a five-star review on, this, on the podcast platform of your choice. That helps drive discovery. And that enables other people that you don't know to find the show. Things have been going great. So we are very grateful to our friends and supporters who've been listening to the show. Uh, Thank you very kindly for your support. The show is growing nicely. We're thrilled. And we'll be back next week with another another Futurist. And Brett King will be joining us again. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. And we will see you in the future. Well, that's it for the Futurists this week. If you like the show, we sure hope you did. Please subscribe and share it with the people in your community. And don't forget to leave us a five-star review that really helps other people find the show. And you can ping us anytime on Instagram and Twitter at, at Futurist Podcast for the folks that you'd like to see on the show or the questions that you'd like us to ask. Thanks for joining. And as always, we'll see you in the future.